final artist talk for figures in the landscape here in VR. We have Thalia Beard um, here to speak about her compelling photograph. It's um, it's called the South Street Power Lines um, 29. So without further ado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So uh, yeah, like like she said, my name is Thalia. I graduated from uh, SMFA at Tufts with my MFA, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist across a bunch of different <laughs> things. I do some animation, some video, some drawing, um, and lately I've been really interested in um, photography and performance. I have a background as a dancer, so that's been really informing my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then research-wise lately, I've been really digging into um, the infrastructure around green energy, especially with um, the new kind of ultimatum about all cars being electric by um, a certain year. Um, and how are we going to have the infrastructure um, to support that kind of call for action. Um, so that led me to power line and corridors, which I stumbled onto kind of accidentally. Um, I was actually researching uh, the nuclear power plant in Plymouth, Massachusetts, which is being decommissioned, so it's mm. not active anymore. Um, and I was walking around, um, there are some mountain biking trails um, adjacent to the the power plant and I stumbled upon this like huge power line corridor and um, it sort of opened up this like um, line of questions for me like um, how these spaces are things that we overlook so easily and things that homeowners often like would rail against having near their homes um, there's even a feature in Adobe Lightroom they're developing to like automatically take out power lines from photos. Um, and so I just thought these spaces were really interesting as they're kind of like flybys sort of, but they're all over the country and yet they're so necessary for transporting green electric energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been kind of exploring different areas um, like this one at the South Street Power Lines around Massachusetts. A lot of them have walking trails attached to them because they are kind of opened up spaces um, near forest. And then um, a lot of them also have um, pretty good environments for like insects and bees and mm. um, animals that need like more open kind of scrubby environments than, than just woods. And so this image um, was just uh, part of a series of me interacting with this landscape and kind of embodying different um, emotions that like come up around, <laughs> around energy and around climate change. And um, what does it mean to have an overlooked space like this or like a quote unquote eyesore space like this become a stage for a performance, for a dance? Um, so a lot of the emotions I think about are like, obviously like sadness and frustration with relation to climate change, but also like hope and growth because, you know, unexpectedly, like these spaces where there's been a lot of man-made intervention have become like kind of adapted by like pollinators and um, other flowers that like need that much sunlight. Um, yeah, so that was basically what was uh, the story behind this photo. Um, it wasn't planned. It, it, most of the most of the work I do is just reacting to in the moment um, the way the the different spaces kind of make me want to <laughs> to move. Um, and then I really fell in love with how kind of ambiguous um, this image came out. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, I can, I can answer them. Um, it's really, it's really beautiful. It's like, it does bring up a lot. It brings, brings up that kind of fear with the, the ominous clouds. <laughs> but then when you yeah. talk about the power lines being like hopeful too, it almost reminds me of like arteries in our veins and like how mm -hmm. necessary it is for us to have this shared power to allow us to have the existence that we have and the comforts that we have. And then, um, yeah, the, the whole composition is 
and especially when you bring up the idea that um, life adapts and that this ends up being kind of a good thing for certain species, um, mm-hmm. that's really powerful too. Um, just love it. Talia, did you um, <clears throat> pick the day based on the cloud coverage or did, was that just a happy um, accident? It was a very happy accident. Yeah. I had to do places based on how the weather's going to be. And then because it's New England, it's never, never the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked out in your favor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious uh, where you shot this. I actually grew up in the suburbs of Boston and we have power lines just like this. And I would always go out as a teenager um, and hang out in, these, in yeah. this exact kind of place. Where is this? Um, let me do a quick search. South Street. I know it's somewhere. Uh, Tewksbury. Mm. Okay. Tewksbury. Oh. Look out. I um, actually have... Had- I have oh, some sorry. right. I have some right near my house too, and I actually do like to walk. There's a path down down there, and I don't. I I do find it like a nice way to connect with nature, even though it started off with a man made system like right. this. Right. Yeah. I think. Um, I think what I really ended up liking about this image too is that it feels like a little bit almost like fairy tale esque. Mm-hmm. Like there's story that you can kind of access it through. And I think there's a certain like a magic that comes from like thinking how we can transport all this energy through these like wires high above our heads. Like that's kind of magic. Yeah. And there's a lot of potential for, for what people will do with that energy. I, and I think you thinking about it as a stage set, this, this um, template like you're doing is so, is so appropriate. Uh, for the experience of those places, because they're, they're like these liminal spaces in between very maybe otherwise built up s- suburbs right. um, with these tall grasses growing and yeah, people just going and doing like mountain biking or like, you know, dirt biking, like all these like things that you're, right. you're kind of relegating to the, uh, where, yeah. where you can do them, so to speak, you know. And, right. And that might not happen on other like public parks or other public walking trails, but here they're sort of anything goes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Wow. But you've made it look like she belongs there. Like if you happened upon her, you would not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I and, and, um, technically speaking, do you use like a remote like to take your photos? Yeah, um, I don't have the best system, maybe. I kind of set it to do a burst of 10. Okay. It gives me 10 seconds to pose. So yeah. a lot of them are kind of accidental. Yeah. I don't know exactly when it's going to go. And I, I actually kind of like I, I like that better <laughs> for the way that you describe yeah. your movement being, yeah, it's you know. Very chance oriented, yeah. for sure. I like that. Uh, it definitely works. It's all natural lighting. Yes. I love how like your body kind of like stands out from the ominous dark clouds, and it's almost like there's a beam of light coming down on you from the side there. Yeah. It was, it was a beautiful lighting day. <laughs> <laughs> love that. Also, to your skirt how it has the black underneath it really like mirrors the clouds the way you know you can see through partially and it's very very dynamic yeah there's kind of a story behind that too because i'm thinking about like reusing and recycling that's Mm. my like eight-year-old ballet skirt and i found it in my closet i was like oh i'll bring this along that's awesome yeah it feels aged and it feels like it's been, um, it's been seen around. some performances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really nice. Well, thank you so thank much you for so sharing. Much. Yeah. Cool. Really, really uh, glad you could be part of the show. Did yeah, anyone else? You. Anyone else have questions or, or comments? My uh, old photographer nerd comes in. What what camera were you shooting with? Um. Nothing fancy. It's like a Canon Rebel 7T or something. Mm. Cool. I, that's, I had a photography professor in university who would just, he would carry around like old point and shoot cameras. And he's like, I don't care about 
how the quality of the picture is. I care about the content of the photo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's always interesting. Yeah, how you you can capture something amazing, something so minuscule. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's in Rafferty, and he'll be talking about his painting, Aurora. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I am down here in Georgia. I'm just about to finish up the MFA program at the University of Georgia. Um, and I got my BFA from UNC Asheville. Um, and that's, that's where this painting comes from. I, I did this series called mythic images um and just thinking about like making collaborative narratives with uh different friends in Asheville, north carolina when, when where i was living at the time um thinking about landscape and the environment and the the landscape of western north carolina in the blue ridge mountains um and creating like this series of improvisational narrative uh, paintings about about like about mythology or loosely based on mythology and the idea of I guess like seeing um, timeless or recurring mythological themes like in, in the everyday moments I got really into like Joseph Campbell and stuff at the time so I was thinking about the relation of mythology and sort of the everyday and and how those things could connect together um, and so this is this was just one of the early paintings in that series um, this is my friend Katie and um I, I would just sort of like it was kind of just like take uh, have an idea to like uh stage stage a figure and, and over time they evolved into more narratives um and uh take some images and then sort of see where they go as far as making a story uh, a little bit after the fact um and so this this got paired with like a another one on nemesis holding a skull and this was just like one of the early pieces in that series, but thinking about um, seasons and, and sort of light, lightness and darkness contrast. So this was sort of like emblematic of um, seasonally of, of the end of winter, early spring, and um, sort of staged with like a mountain summit um, that's pretty typical of what you might see in that area. Um, this is an oil painting on this aluminum dye bond panel. Um, which I was experimenting with working on at the time. It's kind of kind of fun to work on. Um, yeah, my my work has kind of changed uh, a bit since I painted this. So I will be uh, upfront about that. Um, I, I I'm not working quite as much with figuration, and um, I'm thinking about you know things conceptually a, a bit different, a bit more along the lines of Talia. Um, with the more recent work I've been doing about climate and sustainability. Um, but I, I still really, I, I love this work. I love this series. Um, and so I thought it would be really appropriate for this exhibit. And um, yeah, just so, so honored to be able to uh, show it here. Uh, it was really fun to paint a lot of glazing and kind of building up layers um, to get the kind of light effect. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's all I have, about all I have to share. Oh yeah, uh, the, the background was painted like from different images uh, sort of stitched together. Like I mm. take different reference images, um, comparing it with the reference images uh, that Katie and I shot and uh, and then painted a little bit from like memory as well. Just like going out and hiking in the mountains and, mm. and taking mental notes about uh, different temperatures of light and that kind of thing. And then just trying to recall all those different various moments um, to stitch together this cohesive background. Thank you, Jason. Um, I love I love her co her color palette, and it almost feels um, like angelic. <laughs> um, and the the background, how it feels, it feels almost like it's bowing around her. Like it's her. The landscape is kind of adjusting for her so that's cool to hear that you kind of combine those elements from your memory and and you know several references because it feels like it's moving for her <laughs> thank you yeah um 
and that that was definitely definitely the intention with this is to kind of um, make a, a living landscape with, with the figure and, and landscape sort of almost enmeshed and um, yeah um, the luminosity just kind of worked out well it was, it was sort of like just use use the lighting around around you and maybe do a bit of direct lighting but uh, there's mm. like a warm and cool lighting mm. that ended up happening with a window light uh, where where we had shot it um, in addition to like just the sort of incandescent light of the room mm. and um, so thinking about warm and cool light kind of contrasting with each other uh, was kind of fun in, in like in the drapery and, and, and stuff mm -hmm. in particular her facial expression is very interesting to me that um you know the the lighting suggests that she should maybe be happy and smiling but she's got us like a static uh facial expression i love that it really makes it stand out you mentioned it was painted on some kind of tin did you did you find like a lot of difference between working on that material versus on canvas um, yeah, this was, it's just, uh, it's like a material called, um, ACM panel or, or, or acrylic composite mm -hmm. material. Um, you can get it at like a sign supply store in like four by eight foot sheets. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, I, I basically primed it the same kind of way as a canvas. I rolled out gesso with a paint roller. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Judy, are you ready to talk about your piece? Sure. All right. So she's not too far. Just down over Just here. Around the corner. Around the corner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So Judy Duggan McCormick, this is the picnic. It is. So my work, um, I'm a textile artist. Um, I'm went to university. I was a chef prior, uh, you know, B BC, I say, uh, before <laughs> children. Um, I um, decided later on that my, I've always been doing textile art, so I decided I, to go back to school and um, get my bachelor's degree in design in uh, 2011. So doing this as a, as a real thing has, is fairly new to me. Um, my work speaks mostly to um, death, dying, and grieving. And um, not the dark, dark side of it, but the things that in life we've, that used to be um, acceptable or um, commonplace that are now um, not so much that cause us to, to be jarred a bit when we see it in place. So the picnic is something um, that I, the more research I did, I found out that Cemeteries used to mostly be gathering places rather than places that people just went for a brief visit or just strolled through. Um, there's a there's a park near us that um, I found out used to be a cemetery, and when I walked through it, you could see um, like flat earth level uh, stones in it, and people were like letting their dogs pee on them and that sort of thing. It was just such a horrible feeling to me um the more research i did into it it's like these this these this family in particular would take their lunch and go and gather and this could be a, a brother a parent i'm not sure what but they take their feast and, and gather and um uh break bread with with the deceased so this view would have been one of many in the cemetery at the time so um people would Often that's there was their social gathering place, and it was fairly commonplace. If we saw that now, we'd be, you know, thinking maybe the deceased just died, or um, the earth would be freshly turned. But this could be, I don't know, ten years after the fact, and uh, still the respect and the inclusion, and keeping mm -hmm. the um, deceased name um, alive. So the work I do talks about the. Um, the names we no longer say. So if you go through, um, and there's a lot of pioneer cemeteries in North America. Of, uh, they're they've been long forgotten. There's no one to care for their dead anymore. So um, either the municipalities do it, or they just fall into such disrepair that they um, are archived, which means the um, headstones are removed and placed in a common area, and then the fields are used for something else, which is. Mm so heartbreaking. 
Um, with the amount of burial that's happening as our baby boomers um, pass, it's, it's incredible to me that this is going to be a commonplace thing. Burial is still the number one um, choice for um, deceased uh, remains removal. And we're going to run into a huge problem because uh, the amount of uh, earth space we take up. Mm. Uh, what will happen to these people when their their beloved go away? Because obviously, as seen in this scene, nobody's doing this anymore. So it's we're burying the dead, and then we're just saying, there they are. They stay within these gates, and then then what's going to happen to them? They become uh, eventually just someone else's um, problem for sake of a better word mm -hmm. so um, there's a lot of immigration and uh, uh, cultural uh, burial practices that have come to Canada and I presume the United States as well that are unique to um, people's or origins and it'll be I'll be curious to see how this this all plays out in future will we come back to such a, a such a place or like Mexico where um, the dead are so uh, celebrated and so respected mm -hmm. or will we be just um, just you know we, we live in such a fast-paced world that it will just become a place where uh, no one ever goes these beautiful mm -hmm. parks mm -hmm. so it's a it's a very deep rabbit hole when you <laughs> yes. get, get looking at it so yeah you know, I do genealogy as a I want to say a part-time hobby, but it's pretty much all-consuming. <laughs> and um, so I removed the people uh, and then stitched them back in. So as to say, uh, obviously these people are, have been long, long gone too, so they hold their own space somewhere else in a, in a burial plot. But at this time, this is how they would have looked here. So mm -hmm. I'm sure this, this particular uh, plot, which is um, in northern Ontario, uh, is not as well looking now mm. as it was even in this picture. That's the picnic. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's really powerful. And I, yeah, I think a lot of us think of that. Um, I actually just lost my Nana yesterday, so it oh, definitely so resonates. So it's okay. I, she just turned 94. And oh. so yeah, this piece means a little more to me today yeah. um, than it's been in my gallery, you know, yeah. for a month and a half. But um, thinking about it as a celebration and mm -hmm. as an opportunity to kind of appreciate, especially that taking up of space. And my grandfather was um, was buried when I was five, her husband, mm -hmm. and it was always that she would be buried next to him. So that's right. that's what will happen. And um I I know personally I have a different choice that, you know, I'd like to be cremated and be part of, you know, wherever my family is or, you know, part of the trees. It's, it's you know, it's everybody's personal choice. But I think I am, I'm going to be grateful that she has that piece of land. But I think, um, yeah, not taking for granted the fact that that, that is something she's able to, to do and that it I, I definitely remember going to my grandfather's um cemetery a lot like we would ride our bikes there and spend time with him and um mm. I do think that's not done as much and I, I mean uh yeah it's 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 I I appreciate too the the Mexican culture um my daughter's five and she likes to watch Coco, which is yeah. a great movie. But uh, I was I was actually bringing that up with her when I'm trying to explain about, you know, Nana Festig being gone. Right. And um, it, it, it is nice when we can approach it as a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. And I came from an Irish Catholic family and yeah. death was as much part of as my growing up as, as any other celebration. And... Um, now we try to protect our children so much from pain mm -hmm. of death that it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very sh shocking and jarring experience mm -hmm. um, when it's, it's, hap it's going to happen to us all. So like I, I took a different approach with my kids, just mm -hmm. kind of preparing them as mm -hmm. they grew older, that this was an in inevitability. Cool. So how could, we, how could we embrace it rather than be tormented by it? Yeah. Uh, 
meaning not not shocking deaths like like children who are young or or yeah. or, de- or um, illness, but yeah. just natural progression death. Mm-hmm. So. And technically speaking, um, you know, I do have the physical piece in my gallery, and I I love looking at it, and it's very um, intriguing. Like, did you did you? sew first and then cut your material like how, how no, do you technically so do that i manipulated the photograph that these are these are real people mm. um they were in this photograph and i just um before i uh i just uh color removed them so they were okay. just just hollow forms mm. and then uh i printed the fabric oh. um and then i stitched them back in just as as uh you know line work rather than than with color and, or sorry with shading mm. and, and that sort of thing yeah yeah so, so I, they really pop and right, especially that one that is staring back at us and yeah <laughs> she's she's just inviting us to be part of part yeah. of that yes and the fact that she was looking at the camera and the rest had no <laughs> idea that was going on they yeah. were just carrying on their conversations and lunch yeah I think it's a really interesting piece um, to talk about right now, too, because I know at least in the U.S., like, there's been such an absence of collective grief for what's happened right. with, with COVID. And, you know, it's just the whole focus is on moving on and the culture yeah. itself is just like there's no room for it. And I think this is like a really nice piece to like to visualize what. Yeah what grief but also remembering can look like exactly so i see these people have moved on beyond their grief and beyond their um uh like pain and Mm -hmm. now this is more of a uh just a gathering of respect and Mm -hmm. inclusion rather than uh like we can always still have lunch with dad because here we are you know Mm -hmm. it's nice i I feel like in north america in in general, there's like this obsession with um, staying away from like aging and death and, yes. and yeah. like this fixation on youth and beauty. And uh, like, I, I think there's beauty exists in so many different forms, but there's this obsession and on like getting rid of wrinkles and anti aging. Yeah. But like, th- there's a lot of beauty that comes in aging and there's a lot of beauty that comes in in death as well, but it's just this like void of uh, like discussion or narrative or um, <clears throat> any any sort of representation of it in a lot of uh, Western society. Right, and we've been we've been kind of geared towards um, making death very clean. Um, it's it's someone else's job. We we mm-hmm. send bodies to the funeral home. Everything's dealt with there. Where, mm-hmm. in times not that long ago, um, the families dealt with that sort of thing. That it was all you know mm-hmm. the, the 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 bodies were lovingly cared for by their families rather than it being a you know unhygienic uh, sterile practice. So mm-hmm. that plays a huge part in grief when you're you're told you know you can grieve between. Uh, you know, four and seven at this mm-hmm. visitation, and yeah. it takes a lot of the, um, you know, uh, you can have two days off of work, so, you know, make sure you get your grieving done then type right. thing. We're really having to time slot that rather than to um, just feel it as a natural, a natural thing. Like, we have to, you have to go through it. You can't go around it. So, yeah. it, it's, it's tough to be told. Right. And I just noticed my brother's here too. <laughs> hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah, he's he's got the Oculus uh, on, so his hands are free for me. Actually, Jai, do you? Negative. No, he's on the computer today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but it's just a, a beautiful piece, Judy. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. I'm anyone? sorry about your Nana. Danielle. Yeah, thank you. And and the, I, 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 as well. Yeah. I just was telling them about that, Mike. I don't know if you were here. 
Yeah, I caught some of that. You did, uh, yeah. But yeah, I, you know, to Danielle's point, I agree that, like, her, you know, treating it more in celebration of her life, um, you know, she had a great life, made it right. It's one of those things that, you know, we feel like we should all be so lucky, so. Yeah. In that case, you know. Yes. Uh, you know, bring the photos together, the family together, and, and you know, just kind of, again, like, think about it in memory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if I can give you any piece of advice, this this plot of land that you're talking about, Danielle, is is take photographs there tomorrow, like yeah. whenever the funeral is. It, people think it's it's a faux pas. It's not. Oh. They're just as important to archive as as any other celebration is. So yeah. do that and have that, you know, for your kids and their kids, and just just to know that you were a, a life celebrator at every stage. So yeah, thank you, Judy. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, it is true. You, I think we'll think of, yeah, she's the kind of person that, like, you always knew when she was in the room, and so I think even when she's not physically in the room, there's just so many opportunities to picture her there, so yeah. I know that we'll be doing that. Um, well, th- thank you so much for sharing your work, and I'm really, like, I love textiles, and so I'm definitely drawn to the idea of the, the merging between the photos and fabric and the um the also doing the hand embroidery i mean that's something that traditionally has has been done whether people knew it or not to be a relaxing exercise and that in itself yeah. can be um a healing process it sure can mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. awesome well thank you guys for for coming today um, thank you for setting this up this was amazing yeah awesome